All right, let's take a look at the non-steady state diffusion case. So up to now, we've been doing the steady state. We've been setting uh, dc dt equal to zero in our derivation. Now we want to go ahead and keep that dc dt term and see what we get. So today we're going to actually look at decarburization and instead of what we did in 2044. And decarburization, it's usually a uh, byproduct of something like annealing or austenitizing in an environment without um, carbon and so the carbon actually ends up leaving the surface rather than entering and so this is typically uh, not wanted but we're going to go ahead and take a look at the effect and how and the rate of the decarbonization process so it's a 1050 thick steel sheet with 0.5 weight percent carbon that's what our 50 means here and we're going to go ahead and austenitize it in an air furnace where the ambient concentration of carbon is considered zero. And so we're going to end up with this 0.5 weight percent that's initially throughout our solid or throughout our steel. We're going to end up with that diffusing out into the environment and leaving a region near the surface uh, with carbon depletion. And the sheet we're looking at today is two centimeters. So this is a relatively thick sheet. And we'll define what thick really means uh, at the end. Okay, so we'll go ahead and we'll start off with our, our continuity equation. So we've looked at this before. We've got the rate at which mass enters minus the mass that it leaves, our control volume, plus a generation term if we have one. In this problem, there's no generation term, so that's just simply zero. Okay, and so we have our regular um, continuity equation that we've used several times with Cartesian systems. So there it is. Then we'll go ahead and divide both sides by the volume, where the volume is just A times delta X, right? And in this case, since it's a Cartesian system, A is unchanging as we move through the thickness. And so that can cancel out with the A and the volume when we divide, leaving us a delta X on the bottom of our equation. And when we get the delta X on the bottom, then we'll recognize that this looks like the negative derivative of the flux. So there's our, our equation, and from that one we'll go ahead and apply the constitutive, that's fixed first law. So we'll just substitute that in here, and then we'll get back our familiar fixed second law equation. So that's dc dt is equal to d times the second derivative of c with respect to x. Okay, We pulled the d out here because we're making the assumption that it's a constant. I think you can hear a jet plane going by over our house right now. All right, um, so normally at this point, let's just be like step four, we'd apply experimental conditions. And that would be the CDT equals zero for steady state. But now we're gonna be looking at non-steady state. So that is no longer true. The CDT is not equal to zero. So we're going to keep this equation just as it is. So that's going to be our governing equation for our problem. All right, so then the next step we're going to do is to apply boundary conditions. So let's talk about these boundary conditions. We're going to treat this solid since it's thick. We're going to pretend that from the surface on into the center, uh, that that distance is essentially infinite. And we'll talk more about that when we get our final solution, whether that's a valid assumption or not. But we'll go ahead and call this a semi-infinite solid. So it does have a surface, but in the x direction, as we move through the thickness, before we get to the center, we're going to consider that infinite. Uh, again, we'll talk more about that condition and whether it holds for the problem we're doing. So we're going to have an initial concentration uh, in our solid, this is our initial condition. So for all x positions within the within our, our steel through the thickness, so that's t equals zero time, right? Initial condition, we started off with a C0 value. Um, in this particular problem, that was 0 0.5 weight percent. Um, then we're going to have a surface concentration that's fixed at the surface. In our environment, we said that that was going to be equal to zero. So that's at the surface, so that's x equals zero. 
and it's fixed, so that means for all time, okay, t greater than zero. Our next boundary condition is that when x is equal to infinity, as we reach the inside of this uh, film, that our, our decarburization has not reached that deep, and so we maintain the initial value C0 for all time. Okay, so for time greater than zero, we have this location um, that's deep enough in the material that we never decarburize it. All right, so that is our conditions now. So we've got uh, initial and two boundary conditions. Okay, we're going to take a look at this question after we solve our problem. All right, so the way we would solve this governing equation is using the similarity variable and for this type of problem of this form the similarity variable eta that's used is x over 2 times the square root of dt and this uh, works in this form of a problem and so we can go ahead and do that I'm going to uh, let you work on some of these in class so I'm not going to give you the answers quite yet for these, but what you're going to, what we would need to do uh, is we want to substitute for dc dt here in our equation, and so by the chain rule that would be dc d eta d eta dt. Okay, so the dc d eta we're going to keep, and what we're missing here is d eta dt. So we're just going to come up here to this this term eta we defined and take the derivative with respect to time and then place that here okay the next one we would have is dc dx so we're going to do the same thing take the derivative of eta with now respect to x okay. we don't have a dc dx in our equation but we have a second derivative d squared c dx squared so i need this one to get to the next one which is the second derivative okay and so for this one we're going to have the second derivative of of um, c with respect to eta, and that's going to equal uh, the d eta dx that we got right up here squared. Okay. And that derivation for this here is in your uh, course text notes. All right. So once we get those values, then we can go ahead and substitute those all in to here, okay, making the dc dt and making the d squared c dx squared substitutions. So we go ahead and do that. We would substitute them in and we would get an ordinary differential equation. Okay, so this is why we use this. We want to get rid of this partial differential equation that depends on two variables and have an ordinary differential equation now where we only have one variable and that's eta. Okay, so this now is something that we can solve. And then we got to redefine our boundary conditions. We only need two now with, um, with our one variable. So we're going to have a boundary condition of when eta is equal to zero. That's our surface concentration. And when eta goes to infinity, that is our initial condition and our boundary condition at x equals infinity. Both of them are in this one condition. You can see that hopefully from here. Um, if x goes to infinity, eta goes to infinity, so that would be our uh, boundary condition. And our initial condition was t equals 0, which would send this term towards infinity. And so this is also our initial. Okay. This one for x equals 0, eta then is 0. That's just our surface. Okay. So we just brought our equation over. We have these boundaries. We're going to need to go ahead and solve this. So we're going to get uh, now another variable. We're going to define a variable y equal to dc d eta. So we can turn this into a first order. We'll substitute that in. Um, and we're going to end up with d eta, I'm sorry, dy d eta. Okay. So that gives us this term is equal to minus eta times y. Right, dc d eta 
here is equal to y. So now we can integrate. And when we take the integral of this, pulling this, this d eta over and the y over there, we're going to get uh, a natural log. And then I've, I've taken the exponential of both sides because we're solving for y. So we're going to have y then is equal to a times the exponential of minus eta squared. Then we can go ahead and replace the y with dc d eta. That was the way we defined y. Now we have another first order that we can separate and take the integral. So the integral of dc is c. I have an integration constant. And then I want to integrate this term over here. The a can be pulled out because it's a constant. And I'm left with this integral. OK, so now we have a problem, a small one. But this integral here has no antiderivative form. Right? It has no solution in the form of simple functions. So I can take this integral and find the numeric value at any value of eta that I want, but I can't do anything else with it. Okay, so we're going to, what we would like to do though is maybe substitute something in here. I don't want to have to take this integral every time I want to plot my solution. Okay, because the integral of this uh, is a little messy. So the way we would do it, for example, is we could do a series expansion on this exponential of minus eta squared. So I'm just showing you what that looks like, right? A form of e to the minus x squared. Here's the, the series expansion. I just have 15 terms. And then we could integrate then term by term. So that would be here. It's from 0 to a value eta. So I can just keep doing that. Um, the problem with this is I need a lot of terms to get an accurate result out. In fact, if eta is something like 3, I'm going to need 65 terms. So I'm going to need 65 here instead of just 15. So I don't want to, again, have to do this over and over again. So it would be nice to simply tabulate these results and just define a function um, that is the tabulated result of this integral and just substitute that in. So we do that once. Well, this is a well-known form that comes up as a solution and we define that as the error function. So I'm going to show you that in a second. Uh, first just to show you the the um, why we need 65 terms just to give you an idea. You don't have to worry about the coding here but what I'm plotting is the um, solution, the series solution for an eta equal to 3 and I'm plotting it as a function of the number of terms I've used. So I started at like 56 because over here the, the result is, is really crazy. And then we can't um, kind of zoom in to see when it's really plateauing to its final value. But when I start getting around this sort of 55 number, we're getting pretty close to the right answer. And maybe around 65 or so, this kind of settles out to the value of 0.886. 207. Okay. So I need a lot of terms again to start getting a reasonable answer. And the higher this value 3 is for eta, the more and more terms I need. So again, fortunately, we don't have to do that. We can go ahead and use the error function that's built into a lot of packages, some calculators, and it's in Excel. And it's just ERF uh, in Excel. And the error function actually is defined by the integral we just I just showed you, but it does have a constant out front. That's just the way it's been defined. And so really, um, instead of just substituting error function straight in, we need to substitute in the square root of pi over 2 times the error function to get rid of this term. So there we go. That's what we do here. So that messy integral that we had after our constant a is now just simply square root of pi over 2 times error function. And again, this we can just put in a value and it'll, and uh, in Excel, for example, and it will kick us out the value for the error function. All right, so since this is a constant and this is a constant, we'll go ahead and combine them. I'm just going to call that a1 times the error function. 
Um, the error function goes from 0 to 1. After about 2 or so, it plateaus at 1 and it stays that way. So at infinity, it's, the error function is 1 and then starts at 0. All right, so now that we have the, our, fo our final form for the concentration, we just need to plug in the boundary conditions. Okay. And so uh, the error function of 0 is just 0. So we can put that in. So b is equal to cs. And error function of infinity is just 1. And so we have a1 is equal to c0 uh, minus b, which was cs. So it's c0 minus cs. And so there's our a1 and b coefficients. So we substitute those in. So there's our solution then in terms of c. Um, remember this eta is equal to x over 2 times the square root of dt. So we can substitute that in now as well. And the standard form for this equation, uh, these terms are generally moved over to the left side. So it might look something like this, or even better form that we used in 2044 is this one. So I just did some rearranging here uh, with the CS and C zeros to give us this form here, and that brought this one in here. Um, this is a nice form because it gives the concentration, this is what we're solving for, kind of relative to the initial value of concentration. And then it divides by the surface again relative to the initial all right so in class we're going to take a look at this solution a little bit further so i'll have you take a look at that uh, we can answer some of these questions about whether we actually made any assumptions on cs and c0 uh, whether they are ones larger than the other or not so we'll look at that and we will also talk a little bit more about some conclusions and observations. So we'll go ahead and finish this problem up um, in class and discuss this um, plot of the concentration versus position. So I'm going to hold off on those for our class assignment and the question of whether a solid is really semi-infinite.